Lots of mic drop moments at the Big Apple unveil this week, including a rewards credit card that has one big original feature that could be a game changer. But what else do you need to know as you decide whether to add it to your wallet, virtual or real? Plus, we talk about baseball money moves, opening day happening, a monster Mike Trout contract has people talking, epic strategic lessons for all of us. Those headlines plus the big idea tying them all together and so much more on Money in the Morning. Welcome to Money in the Morning. I'm Bobby Rebel from the Financial Grown Up Podcast, coming to you from my very grown up kitchen in New York City. Coming to you from my mom's basement, Detroit, Michigan. I'm Joe Salcihai from Stacky Benjamins. And this is the podcast where we cover two recent headline stories that you just heard, for example, in this case, from the financial press. Not only do we read them like those other podcasts, we get into why they matter to you. And we're going to wrap it all up with a big idea at the end of today's show you can take with you and make your own. Today's episode is brought to you by Emperor Investments. Automated investing refined. Emperor offers 100% equity portfolios designed to earn dividends while you go and enjoy your life. For six months, 100% free, use our link, emperorinvest.com forward slash MITM. That's for six months, 100% free. We're bringing a free podcast for you today. And I know Bobby is super excited because today is opening day for baseball. Aren't you, Bobby? I'm so excited. I've, I literally have a calendar on my wall, an old fashioned one. And I've been like marking X's yeah. right down to the day. I made sure I was back from vacation. So I would be ready, poised, focused, ready to see all the action. And it's, it's amazing. Awesome. People here on Facebook are seeing it. And Bobby's nose is growing longer and longer and longer. The more she talks about opening. But, but I hear about this Mike Trout contract for $430 million, which is apparently for like two years. Um, and I got very interested in what's going on in baseball there. That's I think we all took the wrong career, Joe. That's a pretty big money day for him. Big day. Not bad. So we're going to give Laura a day off today because today we got very special music to kick us off. Hit it. so exciting it is all right so joe wait so wait which story are we doing first are we doing baseball or are we doing apple you know what's sad i think we got to lead with app sadly because I thought we were leading with Apple, and then you played the fancy music, Joe. I think you just wanted us to hear the music. You you just couldn't hold back. Let's charge into the Apple podcast. Charge or into the Apple piece. All right. So this is an Apple piece uh, from Quartz. Now, the headline is, the most original thing about Apple's credit card isn't its app fees or laser etched titanium. Nice hook there, right, Joe? Um, it is from Quartz. And the author, I am going to be terrible at pronouncing his last name. It's John DeTrixie. Man. D-E-T-R-I-X-H-E. And by the way, you guys should check out Quartz's app. I am a pro picker. That means that I need to select stories on Quartz and comment on them. And I have 70,000 followers. There's my humble brag Holy there, cow. So please join, join the Quartz app and uh, follow me. All right. Let's get into this story. All right. Apple formally announced the details of its widely expected credit card, which will offer things like cashback rewards, a WYSI app, and a titanium card with no numbers on it. While many of the features Apple is touting aren't necessarily new or innovative, it is pitching something that is increasingly rare in the digital world, privacy. The tech giant's card, a partnership with Goldman Sachs and MasterCard, rolls out this summer and will be tied to its Apple Wallet app. Customers will get 2% cash back for using the card with its Apple Pay service. Cash back will be available on the day of purchase. By the way, that is a differentiator, but not the one they're teasing in this article. And 3% when used to purchase Apple products directly with the company. Using the physical card at a place that doesn't take Apple Pay gets only 1% back, Joe. 
Apple won't charge fees such as late fees or over the limit charges and claims its interest rates will be among the lowest in the industry at between 13.24% and 24.24%. Just general ranges there, Joe, <laughs> based on credit worthiness. By the way, the average U.S. credit card charges 17.67%. The Cards app is somewhat hum humdrum. It's real-time views of transactions, categorization of spending, and customer support by text are pretty much industry standard among fintech companies. Apple says it will offer a range of balanced payment options and display interest costs in real time to help consumers make better financial choices. So there is a personal finance organizational tool in it, which is nice. Some research suggests that people who use fancy financial apps actually make worse decisions, though, with their money. But on the surface, at least, uh, we're going to talk about that part. Apple's real-time data seems like a step in a positive direction for an American public that often struggles with debt. Apple's tethering of the Apple Card directly to Apple Pay is meant to increase its mobile wallet adoption, which has been slower than some have expected, said Sarah Ratner, NerdWallet's credit card expert. Indeed, data from Loop Ventures shows that Apple Pay uptake in the U.S. has been tepid, although it has caught on more successfully elsewhere. Okay, here we get to the teaser that was in the headlines, my friends. The card's most original feature is privacy. Apple says it won't know where its, where its customers have shopped, how much they paid, or what they bought. Apple says Goldman Sachs will use customers' personal data to operate the card, but won't share or sell it to third parties for marketing and advertising. Um, and Jennifer Bailey from Apple Pay says, features like spend tracking and categorization all happen using on-device intelligence, in other words, localized, not on Apple servers. So that's the thing that they are focusing on. And the article goes on to talk about the fact that Apple CEO Tim Cook has kind of um, skewered, they say, rivals when it comes to data privacy and highlighting their iPhone-centric business model. So they're hoping that that is a big selling point compared to places, you know, we talk a lot about the Facebook privacy issues and things like that. So Apple is really focusing on privacy. Um, but what's interesting, Joe, is that privacy hasn't really been a big selling point to consumers. So what do you think? Is this going to matter? Well, it's funny just looking at the card in general before we get to the privacy piece, talking with with experts that 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 I know and and have spoken with and you I know have spoken with some too. Overall, the features of the card are kind of ho hum. Um uh Nick Clements, a friend of mine who actually is a uh is a sponsor of the Stacky Benjamins podcast. He runs Magnify Money. Nick has always said, if you don't get 2% cash back, you're leaving money on the table. So that's kind of just the entry. And actually, I would say it's even less because it's 2% if you use it in the digital functioning right. way. If you take the physical card, you're only getting 1%. And these digital systems, I, I do use it. But according, this is a fun fact here, guys. Forrester uh, they did a survey commissioned by J.P. Morgan. They found that only 16% of U.S. consumers had used a digital wallet as of this is 2017, but we're early 2019. So maybe a little bit more now. But also this, only 36% of merchants accepted digital wallet payments. So you may want to use it, but you may be out of luck. Yeah. And be the 1%, which is less, as you point out. And you could go right now and just get a get a 2% cashback reward card and you're beating the, the 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 amount of cashback that you get with this card in a lot of cases. And 3% back for Apple products only. I mean, uh, how much are you really spending on Apple? Even if you buy an iPhone, you know, full price every couple of years, 3% of that versus the 2% you would otherwise get, meh. So uh, it's... it's yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting. Then it comes down to the privacy thing. And on, on one hand, I think that the privacy stuff is, is um, I'm kind of like Goldman Sachs has said. I'm one of those people that goes, the Russians already probably know everything about me. I mean, I'm sure there's somebody that knows what cereal I had for breakfast, what I'm, what I'm doing at any time of the day. And it's already so out there. And we already have seen so many protections from companies as our data has been stolen over and over and over. I know that I'll, you know, they'll replace my card. They'll replace the money. They'll, it, it'll, yeah, okay, it'll upset my day some. But does it really, is there, is this something I really need to pay super attention to? And the answer to that is, 
I don't know. Because then I look at the future and I see where thieves are going with our information. They're creating uh, new um, identities that look more and more human all the time, where they're creating synthetic identities and stealing money that way or replicating me to the point that they're more me than I am me. Um, if, if we see that coming in the future, you know, my, my uh, who cares attitude might be way too cavalier. I agree. So yeah, it remains to be seen whether people will, will really consider that privacy is a selling point, but that's what Apple is promoting because they do feel it's a differentiator. On the other hand, do we believe that they are going to be and to remain that far ahead of competitors that make this a priority? That's not really clear because if it did become a priority more than it is now, I feel other companies could catch up. I mean, they're partnering with MasterCard and Goldman Sachs. I have no reason to believe those are exclusive partnerships, certainly not with MasterCard. Yeah. So it's not something that if it became a differentiator among consumers, other companies could not also replicate. And we haven't seen that consumers use that as the key decision maker. Their interest rates, they say they're going to be great. But the truth is, if you have balances on your credit card and you're paying something like that range between 13 and 25%, that 1% difference that they may offer you better may not be your biggest problem. Right. If you're paying that much in interest consistently, that that's how you're choosing a card. And a lot of the reviews have said there are better reward cards out there. Do not pay the, yeah. do not play the credit card reward game. If you have balances on your credit cards, Yeah, don't do that. And also um, this is something that is really for people that, are committed to the Apple ecosystem. They are concerned. They've expressed, they've, other people have expressed concern about the iPhone's ability to maintain its, its extreme dominance for now. We'll see. But <laughs> iPhone has been something that has uh, created worry. So this is a way for Apple to incentivize its customers to stick with the Apple ecosystem. And if you are not in the Apple ecosystem, you're not getting that those higher rewards and you may just not, this may not be worth it. Frankly, we're seeing all the big four tech companies. Yeah. If you're staying with Apple, maybe it's worth it. Yeah. We're seeing all four of the big tech companies do this. I mean, Microsoft has made it easier for you to use their stuff everywhere. Um, uh, Google now doing even, even more than they've done before. Use their stuff everywhere. Uh, 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 Amazon. I mean, look at Amazon competing on every single front too. So um Nothing new here. In fact, they uh, Apple also announced Apple TV getting a lot better, and that's outside the scope of today. But um, but Apple trying to I I'm with you. I I think you're hit it spot on, Bobby. Which is this is just a move to get you to keep stay inside that that system and not go elsewhere. As as defensive as it is, as much as it is playing offense. Agreed, and I think it'll be interesting if they watch how this succeeds or does not succeed and they create an incentive system for people to sign up because they certainly can they could do all kinds of things they have so much money they could certainly just start giving away you know apple music which they charge for right now as a free incentive if you get the card they could start giving away all kinds of different value added propositions for people um, if they sign up so apple is probably monitoring how it goes and may tweak their game that's what I predict, that they will make some tweaks in order to incentivize people. Do you use a digital wallet? I do. I use Apple Pay. Oh, it's a, I don't. I don't use it at all. We do this uh, podcast in front of a live Facebook audience. If you want to hang out with us, it's at uh, facebook.com forward slash iStackBenjamins. And Kelly says that she had a client pay her digitally and completely converted her to digital wallet. How did you get converted? It's so easy, Joe, honestly. And when I go to the checkouts, it pops up and all I have to do is a uh, thumbprint and it pays. It's just so easy. Now, it's, it, I never thought it was a burden to remove the credit card from my wallet and put it in the machine. Um, but now you can't be bothered. Not, it's not about that. It's just, it just happens. It just happens seamlessly. And I've done, done a lot of reporting on payments and the innovations in the payment space. And I do like it, but it's not that Apple Pay is the only system like that. There's plenty of competitors and it doesn't have to be, I happen to be on that system and we happen to be talking about it today, yeah. but the concept is universal of a digital wallet and it works for me, but it may not be something other people want to do. There are people that just prefer to pay in cash. For example, if you're a budgeter and you like to have an envelope of cash that is for your groceries for the week and that's working for you, go for it. 
Well, and I think we're going to see more of that where we see uh, the the envelope system. You know, we've already got some fintech companies that do that, right? Create envelopes and people create digital envelopes because I see the, those two merging. Karen is with us and she apparently lives on the frontier because she says some stores in her town only take cash or check. And then she reiterates, yes, check. Who takes a check? Yeah. Well, actually I can send checks digitally and that's what I do now through my bank. And I also agree. Um, Kelly had made, Kelly makes a comment that she says, I don't have to dig through my purse with tiny children in my arms. That actually is something I forgot to mention that I am often, for example, at a supermarket in our neighborhood with my child. And it is one less thing because it just, there's other things happening. And I have a child that's old enough that he's usually helping me load up the groceries, but it's one less thing to do. You don't have to look for this credit card and it's wedged behind the other card and this and that. And then the chip doesn't work, whatever it is. But there's a negative point to this as a consumer, and it's it's part of what Stanislav here is saying. Stanislav says, I love how Apple Pay and the credit card tap feels like you're not even spending money. Super easy to track how much money you spend. The super easy to track part is nice, but the doesn't even feel like you're spending money part could be, could be uh, I mean, the easier it gets for money to come out of your wallet, the 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 uh, uglier it can get for you financially. And as I said, in the article, they did say that research does suggest people who use fancy financial apps, I don't know how fancy Apple Pay is, but that they actually make worse decisions with their money um, because maybe it doesn't feel like, it just kind of feels like the, little, the gamification of it doesn't feel as real. The irony, um, one of our listeners mentioned about cash and checks only is here in New York City, there are quite a few places that have moved to uh, credit only. They, they are cashless. Wow. in there in in be, in how you can pay for things they will not take cash yeah i well and clearly that's i think where we're headed i think we end this segment to go on to the next piece with uh, mike's uh comments because mike has has enveloped this great theme we have of baseball, baseball. stuff so <laughs> leading into mike's uh comments let's do this And of course I turned it down. <laughs> so I love doing this live because everybody's waiting for me. What's going on, Joe? Yeah, here's what's going on. <laughs> Maybe. Sometime. Please go. Mike says that Apple Wallet is a foul ball. Maybe next year will be their pitch to hit. Good on them for taking an at bat. And then, oh, no, no, he doesn't stop with that. The credit card partnership game is in spring training for a few years, he says. I think we'll see more partnerships like this one emerge. I kind of agree, don't you? Can we hire Mike as our copywriter? <laughs> he's, he's, he's got it. Much better than me pressing the buttons on the uh, organ player here. Uh, all right. Our second piece today comes to us from Forbes. And let's uh, jump wholeheartedly onto this baseball theme that we have here on baseball's opening day. And by the way, before we get to that, I think the takeaway from that piece is kind of a more to come, Bobby. Privacy is a selling point. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know. I, I predict they will tweak the offer. Yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm on that too. All right. Uh, a, a friend of uh, my Michael K wrote this piece uh, for Forbes money and baseball, how to strategize your money life. Perfect for opening day. Mike, uh, Michael writes, I love baseball. If you just think of the number of variables involved in every play and how the strategy of the game changes from each pitch to each batter, what's not to love my love of the game also involves the time between the last pitch of the World Series and the first pitch of the regular season, also known as the hot stove season. This is where fans speculate, consider whether their team will sign a notable free agent or trade for a player that will hopefully complement their March to October baseball. As a lifelong Yankees fan, that's where he loses me, by the way. I can't I can't understand how somebody be a lifelong Yankees fan, but whatever. As a lifelong Yankees fan, I've watched and read with interest the various moves and speculation about the potential moves, signings, and their implications. There's a vast number of variables that impact the outcomes of moves or non-moves. When it comes to your money life, there's also a vast number of variables that impact your chances of success. Consider the practice of contributing to your 
401k or other retirement plan. You must consider many things like how much to contribute, how much time you have until you begin drawing, how much risk you're willing to take versus how much risk you need to take, and whether to increase your contribution as the allowances go up, whether and when to rebalance that portfolio, not to mention how to assess the given choices, cost management expertise, and performance. Let's take another example. Consider the number of decisions and implications of buying life insurance. You must consider how many things, like how much to buy, the type to buy, when to buy, how long it's needed or appropriate, the uh, quality and reliability of the company, the underlying assumptions of the policy, and any convertible features or built-in flexibility. The same can be said for save versus spend decisions, buying a house versus renting, locating assets for tax efficiencies, hiring professionals, gifting, investment strategies, estate planning, and selecting a college savings plan. The sheer number of possible outcomes is enormous depending on the nature of your decisions and how you go about making those decisions. Like baseball, each decision can have a wide array of potential outcomes, but the ramification of poor decisions are vastly different. A baseball fan always has next season, but in terms of your financial well-being, you cannot stay the same. And then he goes through a few of the ways that you can, quote, hot stove your uh, finances. And we'll talk about some of those in a second. But, But he goes back to baseball and says, in baseball, a drafted player isn't going to proceed from single A ball to double A without advancing their skills. Nobody goes from rookie ball to the majors without increased skill and abilities. And the organization knows full well who's doing that. As we draw here to opening day, I'm excited by the prospect of how my team will do. I anticipate how the newly acquired talent will perform as well as the returning members of the squad. I know that injuries are part of the game and our impacts as our impacts of variables like rainouts, traveling schedules, pitching rotations, and the strategies and skills of the adversaries of the opposing dugout. And then he draws a correlation with your financial life about how you're going to have setbacks, Bobby. Things are going to happen. But you know what? If you're always advancing your talent and trying to put together a better team financially, you are find yourself in the playoffs. Well, I think what he's also saying is that there are two different things to look at, the things you can control and the things that you cannot. So there are certain things in terms of your investing outlook, as you say, unexpected macro events that you just can't control, like a rainout or whatever it may be. But you can control who's on your team. And so he's looking at the different players, just like you're looking at the different assets that you have. And it doesn't necessarily mean individual stocks. It could mean diversification in your investments. Like you may have index funds for your stocks. You might have, um, maybe you have bond funds. Maybe you have real estate as an investment. Maybe you have collectibles as part of your portfolio, whatever it may be, that's your diversification. And of course, even things like insurance, as he mentions, is part of your investment. You're investing in insurance to protect from things that you can't predict. That's part of your sort of investing ecosystem. So I like what he says a lot. I love that. I love that idea too, that it's personal because you'll see different teams try to emphasize different things and certainly different families are emphasizing different things. And by the way, that that's a great analogy too, is that there's a lot of baseball teams. Well, every baseball team has a mission and something they're trying to accomplish. And I love what Stephen Covey does when he talks about this. He talks about having a family mission statement and working from there. I love that idea, which even more closely, I think, ties these two ideas of baseball and financial success together. Because once you know what the team's mission is and what you're trying to achieve, then that diversification and, you know, the whole life insurance stuff he talks about, spending plans, all those things, those all kind of work backwards from that mission. And part of his theory is that, as you say, you set things up towards your mission, whatever that is, your family mission, if you have a team, your team mission, but you also stay alert, you keep paying attention and you make those tweaks, you make those changes along the way as life events that you control and life events that you don't control happen to you. And so make a plan, but be ready to adjust that plan. I like this also, we talk about hiring professionals because people ask all the time of, should I hire a professional? And it's funny, on some teams, maybe they need just a new batting coach. They need just somebody who's going to help them do one thing. Like as an example, I hired somebody who helped me get to inbox zero and, and taught me how to work that. Um, and that was really, it, it was interesting. It was fascinating, but it was also this micro thing that I really wanted to get better at. And a lot of times people think when I hire a pro, I need to hire a pro who covers everything. You can hire somebody that just 
helps me with this one little thing. Or on the other side, maybe you do need a financial planner or a coach or somebody smart in your corner who's just going to push you, you know, more broadly toward a better, a better, um, a better season, I guess, if we're talking about, about well, baseball. And, well, and, and not to get too better here, but your life has seasons. You go through different phases in your life where you need different things. So you may need someone who is watching broadly that you may check in with once a year, maybe once every two years, but in one phase of life, you may have a life change. Like you have a child or you get married, whatever it is, or you have a job change or your goals change. And you might need a specialist to update your will for that or to make changes in your life insurance. So these things can have different seasons, just like baseball has different seasons with different things happening, both controlled locally and also that just happen in this sort of macro universe that you can't control. And, and you know, it's funny when we, when we think about this, this correlation as well, I like this idea of, of how teams more and more using data, they used to just go and send scouts out and look at people and they'd make a gut decision, but more and more. And if you watch the movie Moneyball, you saw this, uh, it's a book. It, it really is a great book. The movie's good. The book is fantastic. But when, when, when you look at, at data, I think too many families don't make decisions using data. They instead use these gut feelings that baseball teams used to use uh, way in the past. And the cool thing is, is that data is easier. It's easier than ever to get. And the sad thing is, I think some of us get too caught up in data, which is why people that have the fanciest apps don't always make the best decisions. But, but, but I would challenge most of us. I think most people listening to this podcast aren't using data nearly enough to make financial decisions. They're going with their gut feeling about, well, I think I can probably do this a little better. Is that but really your biggest weakness? If, if you have the information, you could still stick to your gut decision, but make it in a more informed way and understand the benefits and the consequences of that decision. You may decide that something is very important to you. For example, you may have a wedding in your family that you want to contribute to, and you can look at the data and you might just know, okay, it's not the best decision. I'm going to make it anyway. You can override that data <laughs> if that's what's important to you. That's okay. But at least you have the data you know you're spending too much, and maybe you can put a plan in place to course correct later down the road. Having the data doesn't mean you can't still make what's the holistic right decision for you. I don't want to say the wrong decision because, as I said, we go through seasons in life, and what's always the absolute best decision by the data may not be the decision we want to make even if we know the data. Have you seen that when you were doing the your your financial grown up book or when you're when you're interviewing people for the podcast, Bobby? You mm -hmm. have to see people that said, you know what, here's the date. I'm going to go a different way, and it ended up being the best thing that they could have done. It goes both ways, absolutely. I mean, I I love Barbara Corcoran, and she is very proud of the fact that she will spend money before she makes it. She feels that is a driver to both productivity and success. And she is proud that that is one of the ways that she motivates herself. She will spend money, for example, on marketing before she receives the sales revenue and so on. So it works for her. She's kind of ignoring the data of what she should quote should spend, but it works. That's that is crazy. Oh. I know uh, I worked with a financial planner. What's that? She's Barbara Corcoran. Well, of course for her. I worked with a financial planner who bought an expensive car and bought it on payment so he'd force himself to work harder to make more money, which I think is dumb. I would yeah. If you I mean if you have if you have to buy it in payments and it's the right it's the right decision, you need the car to go to work or whatever, uh, that's fine. But if that's the only reason you're doing it, hmm, I don't know. But look, everyone, you know, we're all human and there's a lot of psychology that goes into this and a lot of nuanced decisions and people make decisions that achieve their goals even and their goal may be to buy something totally irresponsible, but they can make that decision. It's just better to make it knowing that it's a bad decision. Yeah. Yep. It's okay. We're not judgy here. No, but... You know what that sound means? It means Mike has some more comments. <laughs> well, is Mike the third co-host? I, I think he is today because he's just rolling with the baseball theme. Mike says, if you don't have proper insurance in place, that's like having no relief pitching. Wouldn't be prudent to do that. Going to lose games. Bobby is now furiously looking up relief pitching and what the heck that means. 
wasn't there a Saturday Night Live skit where somebody goes, wouldn't be prudent? Wouldn't oh, be- I know. It's it's Dana Carvey making fun of George Bush, right? Yeah, that that is that is. I, I thought it was going to be the evil uh, whatever lady, the evil church lady, but it wasn't. It was it was the George yeah. Bush skit. Yeah. Oh, no, maybe it is. Is it the evil church lady? I don't remember. Oh gosh. Mike's, All right. Mike's, anyway. Mike's not done there. He says, got to put your best nine players on the field and organize and prioritize your batting lineup. That's kind of like allocating your spending and selecting your investment allocation, clean parable, baseball and money. Nice, nice work. I think on that note, we're about ready to head to the uh, big idea. But before we do that, I want to say just a few words about our sponsor, Emperor Investments, because if you're trying to play your best game, how about that, Bobby? You're so good, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) You're trying to play your best game. Emperor Investments can help you bring it. Emperor Investments is automated investing refined. Talk for a second about why I like Emperor Investments so much. First of all, whenever you think about investing, you should ask yourself about the risks that you're taking. Emperor's investment philosophy prioritizes consistency without sacrificing returns. What does that mean? They only custom build your portfolio out of companies that have a long-term track record, a consistent dividend payments. They're likely to continue paying in the future and the companies that can be purchased at a fair price. Might be asking yourself, well, how do they customize it if it's automated? That's because everybody reacts to financial losses differently, and Emperor begins the process by getting to know you. But unlike other financial advisors, or excuse me, robo-advisors, they also get to know your goals so that they can further personalize your portfolio across different industries. And Emperor Investments is a great way to set your financial goals and get on the path to achieving them through investing. Uh, Six months free if you use our link. And by the way, Emperor does so many things different than other robos, which is why we like having them here. Emperorinvests.com forward slash MITM gets you to six months free with them. Emperor Invest. Don't go to Emperorinvestments.com. That's a different site. It's Emperorinvest.com forward slash MITM for six months of Emperor Investments free. And thanks for Emperor Investments for making our podcasting season go well. Exactly. And you know what? One of the things that I really like about them is they sort of have a Warren Buffett um, view of the market. And so they take that buy and hold strategy. Um, and so it's a sort of balance between that and being passive with the ETFs and so on. And, and also, frankly, it's a lot about cash. I mean, dividends, dividends are a big thing. A lot of really smart people focus on funds and stocks that pay dividends. And that is something they really prioritize at Emperor. A bird in the hand, as my mom says, that's what a dividend is. Yeah. It's about money. That's right. All right, Bobby, we've got a big idea here. Uh, we didn't t- who's, who's doing the big idea? Are you doing it or am I doing it? You're doing it. All right. Our big idea today is is this. When it comes to whether you're Apple and you're tra- – do you see what Apple's doing here? Apple's creating this ecosystem and they're strengthening it. And the whole first piece was about not just about privacy and about this new credit card, but it's about them strengthening their team – And it's funny because if we look at ourselves as companies, we want to do what great companies do. And Apple over the years has been a fantastic company. And you look at how this is not just an offensive move, then with the new credit card, then with more Apple TV, it's a defensive move as well. Create a stronger ecosystem. And it's the same when we look at Michael Kay's piece. And we talk about our own financial team. Michael builds these great analogies to us as a team and looking at where are our strengths, where are our weaknesses, putting together our best lineup. Do we hire coaches? Where do we need those coaches? How do we have a spending plan? All of that is based on where we want to go and much like Apple strengthening our ecosystem. So I think Bobby, our takeaway for today, the big idea, create a great team. Very well said, Joe. I'm glad I'm on your team. Happy. I'm glad I'm on your team too. I didn't expect that. Thank you very much. That's going to do it for today. Uh, Go stack some Benjamins, everybody. And if you want to live a rich life, you got to be a financial grown up. Bye, guys. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, hosted and produced by Bobby Rebell and Joe Saul Cihai, is engineered by Caden Thompson, and all put together by a pack of well-trained ferrets down here in Joe's mom's basement. 
You'll find Bobby at the Financial Grown Up Podcast and Joe at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Go say hi to them there too. Online, visit us on Twitter at Average Joe Money and at Bobby Rebel, or come join a live recording at our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash iStack Benjamins. I know you already know this too, but money in the morning is for entertainment purposes only. You should not act on anything recommended by a bunch of entertainers in a basement or even a Manhattan kitchen without first consulting your financial advisor and second, dude, have your head examined. Have headlines you'd like us to discuss? Send them to joe at stackingbenjamins.com or put them on our Stacking Benjamins closed Facebook group. This show is a collaboration of Stacking Benjamins LLC and BRK Media LLC, copyright 2019, all rights reserved. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I reserve the right to always say, we'll see you next time back here on Money in the Morning.